Welcome to this talk on improving code quality with static analysis. My name is Joe Purcell. I've been part of the PHP community since 2003. I'm a senior developer at Digital Bridge in Chicago. We build e-commerce solutions for mid-sized companies in the Midwest. Um, I gave this presentation in Dublin last year, and in the keynote, or the Dries note, I was inspired by Dries's talk to give a thank you to all the people who have helped shape my career. Um, I could say many great things about each one of these people. Um, Larry Garfield, known as Krell, he's down there at the bottom, uh, he was asked to leave the Drupal project about a month ago. Um, it's left me with a lot of confusion and frustration. I've had many conversations and read the public information available. Um, one thing that I will say is to me, he's been an inspiration for why I'm here presenting and um, I, I want to trust him. Uh, I have no reason not to. Um, but more importantly, the Drupal community is much larger than Dries or Larry. Um, and that's why we're here. We're here to grow and to learn from each other. Who are you? How many of you know, if I said uh, cyclomatic complexity, how many of you would know what that is? Raise your hands. OK, great. Um, I assume that you value code quality and want to get better. Uh, the takeaway for today is you're going to have more information about how to improve your development workflow or improve your project using static analysis. Uh, let's start with a story before we get in. Um, so this example here, it's a picture of a sign that says private customer parking only, all others will be toad, but the word toad is, not, is spelled like the frog, not T-O-W-E-D, like you're gonna tow your car, which is funny. Um, humans are pretty forgiving in this case, right? Like we know this is either someone making a joke or um, maybe it's a typo, either way it's kind of funny. And there's an urban legend around this called typoglycemia. The idea is if you take any word and you scramble the letters in the middle, um, you can still understand what the word is. So I've written a phrase here, who needs a spell checker? Uh, I hope you're all, you, everybody uses a spell checker, right? Like your browser has one built in. Um, so spe what's interesting here is to humans, spelling isn't required for comprehension, but for computers it is. They're not so forgiving. And we're gonna go to a story. This goes back to 1962. The US was launching their first interplanetary mission. Uh, they were going to inspect Venus, the planet. Uh, it cost $18.5 million. Today that's about 150 million. <coughs> minutes, within minutes of um, activating the launch sequence, they noticed that the guidance system was not responding properly to commands, and they had to self-destruct the vehicle. Um, after inspection, what ended up happening was this was back when humans would transcribe information, and when they were copying information and, and writing the program for the guidance system, they didn't use a smooth value. Now, a smooth value was indicated by a bar, uh, a horizontal bar above uh, one of the variables, and that was missed. So instead of using smooth value, there was also a hardware failure. So hardware failure combined with uh, buggy code was why they had to destruct this. Now, some know this as the most expensive hyphen in history. The point here is clear. Computers will do exactly what you tell them to, no more, no less. 
Now let's see, let's go to a more uh, modern day example. Have you heard of GoToFail, <coughs> the iOS bug, a um, couple years ago? Uh, this was September of 2012 in iOS and OS X. This code statement was here in the um, SSL library. The problem was that this bug allowed anyone to perform a min in the middle attack with an SSL connection between an iOS or OS X device. It wasn't fixed until two years later. Um, now, to those who are not programmers or don't have a keen eye to what's going on here, let me explain. So you see the two go-to fail statements. The second section here, that's actually how it would get executed. So it would have the conditional and it would say go to fail. And then um, if it didn't pass into that, it would run the second go to fail here. So the problem is any code after that second go to fail would not get executed. It's a very simple example, but Martin Fowler in his blog post pointedly pointed out that this bug could have been fixed by static analysis. The point for today is if you're not using static analysis, you're wasting time. Um, you could put more time into training or configuring your IDE or what have you, but um, we're going to talk about how you can uh, improve your process with that. Um, I'm sure all of you who are developers are very familiar with the grind uh, on poor code. You make a change, a week later you have to fix it. Or revise that section of code again. So uh, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about static analysis and uh, present a definition for what that is so you understand that more clearly. We're going to go through some examples of what static analysis can find in code. And we're going to talk about how to do continuous in inspection, which is incorporating that into your development process. So first of all, what is static analysis? It's essentially a spell checker for code. It's anything that you can learn from code without executing it. So going back to the go to fail example, if we ran a static analysis checker on the go to fail example using Drupal community code sniff, you would see that the hash handshake method does not util uh, utilize as a go-to statement. You're not, um, the coder code styles suggest not using, or uh, PHPMD suggests not using go-to statements. Inline control structures are not something allowed. That's a Drupal community thing. So you know how you can type an if, uh, like a if conditional and not put the curly brackets? That would, have get, that would have gotten flagged with a static analysis checker. And then lastly, you would get an error because the second go-to fail, even if you are using a inline control structure, the second go-to fail is indented too far. So on the, how is this done? How do these tools do this? I mentioned PHPCS, uh, which is what Drupal Coder uses, and PHPMD. All it's doing is reading a file off disk and looking for a pattern. And there's a lot of tools that do this. Um, copy and paste detector, which is looking for any copy and pasted code. We all do this, um, but you're not being dry that way. Uh, lines of, there's a PHP LOC, a very simple tool to gather information about how many lines of code there are compared to comments, etc. And there's many other tools that come up um, that do different types of reporting and many other languages have very similar tools like these. So let's try them out. We'll go through two examples. Um, one, one check would be global variable access. So if you're writing code and using a global variable, typically frowned upon for a number of reasons, um, but essentially what, the, what that check is doing in PHP is it's going to look for any reference to the word global. Uh, you, you could do this yourself using grep, um, but PHP mess detector is a tool that <coughs> aggregates that, or PHP CS. 
Another example would be an unused variable or method parameter. This check is for uh, if you've ever made a, a spelling error in a variable name, it, it, it can surface as an unused variable. So this check would go in and find, and here's an example that I pulled out. Um, these examples are all from Drupal. The second line here is assigning get entity to a variable, but nowhere in this method is it used. So kind of interesting, right? Like you can run this program to help you spell check your code. The point of this is when you're writing code, there are certain things that smell like a bug or they, um, it smells of poor coding, right? If it stinks, change it. So uh, there's a book called Refactoring. I recommend reading it. It's a good book. And it's referring, referencing how do you know when to change a diaper? Well, if it stinks. Uh, so I, I think that principle applies well here because as we go through these examples, you mm -hmm. might be thinking, well, I've done that and it made sense at the time. Well, the point is if um, uh, there are going to be false positives or cases where it makes sense, static analysis is a tool that can help you identify when it's not. So I've uh, gone through and categorized some of the checks that we're gonna go through. And I wanna go through each of these checks um, like for example, psychomatic complexity, we're gonna go through that. So you're, if you ever see these in one of the tools, you know what it means. Um, but I've categorized these uh, with topical areas that will make the project harder to work with. So readability might be things like code style. Um, if you are doing code review and you read thousands of lines of code, it's very nice to have a consistent format, so readability, or if it's indented very strangely. Uh, maintainability, software is always mutating. You are always making changes to it. So how easy it, is it to maintain and apply updates to it? Extensibility, you have a client who wants a new feature. How easy is it gonna be to add that? Security, um, one, prominent area uh, or topic is security for static analysis and there's tools that just focus on security because of its importance. Um, but th those, there are checks that we'll talk about that relate to that. Um, testability, uh, complexity, the psychomatic complexity example will apply here. Some code is a lot harder to test, uh, which makes it more hard to maintain. And correctness. So. You can write code that meets the business requirements, but is it efficient? Um, and we'll go through examples of each. So global variable access, we already looked at this one. Why, why would this be something you wouldn't want to have in your code? Well, testability, first of all, you have to ensure that when you execute this method that you're setting the state properly. If you don't, or if you have another test that has set it, um, and then you run another test that is also setting it to a different value, you might run into a flaky test, an issue with a flaky test. Um, there's no sanita sanitation of this variable here. <coughs> Globals is properly named because any, uh, any place during execution time can modify this variable. Are you ensuring that a malicious user hasn't um, injected code or what have you and set this to a variable that might introduce an exploit? And then extensibility. There's, there's no abstraction you can do here on the globals variable because it's not a class. So you couldn't, you couldn't do like uh, type inference or you know, sub, subclass it to add some behavior to it. The other example we talked about already was the unused variable or method parameter. We mentioned this here, like it's, it's unclear what entity that variable is doing. Was this a bug? Like did, did the author of this um, intend to use it but just forgot to? Or was it an artifact of refactoring at some point? Uh, we, we don't know, so if you're gonna, 
if you're gonna <clears throat> if, if you're assigned a ticket or you see a ticket in the Drupal issue queue and you see this method and you're trying to debug it, like you're reading every line of code, you read this, you don't you don't know what to do. Um, incorrectness, right? Like this, there's no. If get entity is an expensive call, you're you're wasting effort there. You're wasting execution time. So we could make this method more efficient. Dead code. We looked at this with go to fail, where you have a. Um, yeah, I, d I don't I don't think this example shows it clear enough, but in this method that I found, there was a section of code that got executed, and just like go to fail, there was code afterwards that never got executed. The problem with that is, you know, you're gonna ask the question, um, you know, why, why, is this, uh, why is this code here? Was, was it a bug? Um, did the author intend to use it, and was it refactoring, but uh, didn't reincorporate this method? Um, and then correctness, if, if that code isn't getting executed, you're wasting lines of code. Like, uh, people are gonna be reading this. Number of public methods. Now, this one's a little controversial because we have some classes where it's nice to put um, a lot of functionality, a lot of behavior into a single class, just to have an e easy point to reference. Um, <laughs> But there's a limit, right? Like there's, as humans, there's a limit to how much we can understand and how much we can easily maintain in a single class. If you have a lot of methods, it's usually an indication that you're vi violating the single responsibility principle, if you're familiar with solid design. Um, so if, if you were asked to extend entity, t the entity type class, you have to make sure that you're doing that in such a way that you're accounting for every single one of these methods. Um, in, this, in this example, there are almost 70 methods, public methods, on the entity type class. So you have to account for every, every single one of those methods to make sure that you're extending it properly. Um, and then correctness, as I mentioned, the single responsibility principle usually applies in this case. Now, if you're using PHP mess detector, it'll uh, throw this kind of alert, and you can set a threshold. Um, I think the default might be 100. No, that's not right, 50. I think it's 50. Uh, anyway, each one of these has uh, typically has a default. Use of statics. So um, I know frameworks like Laravel encourage the use of statics with like facades. And even in Drupal, uh, you might use, in this case, we do load multiple. Um, there are other entity API calls that you do as a static call. Or if you're not injecting a service, you might be calling, like getting the logger service, for example, and that's a static call. Well, one of the challenges there is testability. You can't stub the load multiple method because it's calling the workspace type class. You would have to essentially replace that class, which I, I, I don't think you can even do that. So. I, when it comes to testing, you're gonna have to make sure that whatever load multiple is doing, that you're accounting for it. So if it's making a call to a database, you need to make sure the database is available. So statics like this in your code makes it, makes it harder to test. Um, if you're actually creating a, uh, an instance of a class, you could mock that. Or if you were injecting the workspace type uh, object, you could, in, during, like in your test during the setup, you could just totally replace workspace type and control what load multiple is returning so that you can uh, have finer tuning on what you're testing with this add method. And then extensibility, um, you can't subclass workspace type. You will, if, if you have a static call, you'll always be calling that exact class. You won't be able to override that. Um, oh, one, one thing to mention here with statics too. Sometimes you use statics to ensure that you're, you're controlling extensibility. Sometimes you don't want people to extend. For example, the Drupal class, um, there's an intention there to have 
uh, consolidated place to, uh, like for example, like calling the, the container or the logger, et cetera. Uh, so that there are some framework decisions that might make sense uh, for the use of the static. Uh, missing doc comment. Uh, Drupal does a really good job with documentation. And this, in this example, this is, I'm picking on a contrib module here, and uh, this method didn't have a doc comment. So you see this, and it's so nice to see a module, like the group module, um, has excellent documentation. So you can read through the whole thing and know exactly what's going on, rather than having to read the lines of code and do the computation in your head. Uh, so in this, in this case, um, that documentation isn't there, so if you want to, um, if you want to update it, you have to run through the whole computation. You need, you need to go to the do replication method and understand what that's doing. Because one of my immediate questions looking at this is it looks like the update method is just a wrapper around do replication. Um, I actually know why the, uh, why this is here, but, um, and then extensibility. So if you want to add a feature to this and it's related to uh, this update method, you, you have to understand it before you can extend it. <coughs> In some ways you could consider missing documentation a critical bug. Uh, great, so this one's a fun one uh, because it's lots of fancy words that mean something really simple. Um, in path or cyclomatic complexity. I'm combining the two because they serve a similar purpose. The purpose of either one of these metrics is to clarify how much, how much complexity there is in your method or in your code. Cyclomatic complexity counts the number of control structures, the if statements, switch statements, etc., and tallies one for each one of those. The difference between cyclomatic complexity and in-path complexity is that in-path in com counts those control structures, but it also counts operators. So if you're doing like, you know, ampersand ampersand or an or operator, it'll count those as well. So in-path will count the number of paths through the code, including operators. Cyclomatic is just looking at the number of um, control structures in your code. This is a very, a uh, handy way to know like how many tests to write. So if you have a cyclomatic <laughs> complexity of three, you have three uh, if statements, you probably want to have three tests to test each one of those, if you're doing unit testing. Um, if you have high values with either of these, there might be a problem with readability. Um, if you've ever read like nested for each loops, it's kind of hard to read, or nested conditionals, right? These, these things are hard to read. Uh, maintainability, try to debug this. Um, this disable entity types method has a psychomatic complexity of 15 and an end path complexity of 420. So when, when you're like uh, trying to debug this, you have to think through, maybe not all paths, but many of those paths. So it, it makes it harder to debug. And then correctness, sometimes a high number is an indication of you're violating single responsibility. Um, you might be trying to do computation uh, on information that's not directly impacted by the, this class under test. Efferent and afferent coupling um, also uh, kind of fancy mm -hmm. words, but something very simpler, simple. Efferent coupling means the class under test knows about many other classes. Afferent cu coupling is the opposite. Afferent is you have many other classes that know about this one class. Why is this important? Well, it's very important. Efferent coupling is very important when you're trying to test the class. In this example here, multi-version manager, it has f 15 classes that it knows about. If you wanna write a test for this class, you have to, and, and you wanna do unit testing, and you're not doing kernel test, you're doing <coughs> a solitary unit test, you would have to write a test double for all 15 of those dependencies in order to control what the 
indirect inputs are, and outputs are to that method. Um, this also means that if any of those other 15 classes change, you may have to refactor your tests. That's totally unrelated. Um, afferent coupling uh, has a bit different impact. Um, the impact there is if you have many classes that know about your one class, uh, such as the Drupal class, and you want to make an API change, a breaking change, that means that you have to change all of those other classes. It's a metric. Um, I don't know what the threshold is. I think the threshold is 10 in PP mess detector. You can, again, you can configure that. But the idea is you, when you see this, it's an indication that this code um, is going to be hard to extend. Uh, the high coupling here means that you're going to have a lot of classes to be aware of when you're extending this class. If you want to over, override the functionality, it's going to take a lot of effort. And what's nice is you can know this at a glance. You just you run static analysis, you get the number, and you can have like a gut reaction to how hard it's going to be. And then testability, I already mentioned, it's going, you'll have to write a test double for each one of those classes. And correctness, um, usually if you're aware of this many classes, you might be violating single responsibility. Again, you're, you as the human, um, you'll know. It, if, it, if it stinks, then change it. Space before parenthesis. Um, code style is a valid quality metric. When you have a code base as large as Drupal and you're reviewing um, someone else's code, it makes it very nice to be able to see a consistent format of the code. Now, whether like curly brackets on the same line makes more sense than not, I think that's a separate conversation, but just more importantly, having that consistency is very important. It's very useful, especially if you're doing code review. So this example here, and I actually ran into this last week, um, you'll notice on the fourth line, you see get total price on the far on the far right on that last line. The um, that's actually a method call, and the the brackets for it are on the next line. So readability, like your first reaction is this looks different. Why does it look different? Yet yeah, you can't have to, you know, read each character to pick up why. And maintainability. Um, Let's say I didn't need to change this line of code, but I saw it and I want to fix it because it's hard to read. Um, if you fix it, you might be creating a merge conflict with some other ticket that's like RTBC ready to get merged. So in Drupal, there is kind of a strict, you know, only change what you have to. So checks like this are very nice to uh, surface before someone makes that contribution. All right, so we've gone through a number of checks. How do you do this? How do you do a continuous inspection? How do you tie that into your day-to-day, -day, week to week? I'm going to use some examples from Code Climate. Code Climate is different than a lot of tools in that it's a platform. So they, they don't just have one static analysis engine. They have many. They have um, like, um, some for PHP, some for JavaScript, et cetera. Um, and it's free for open source. So their, their alignment or goal is to be free for any open source project. Right now, they only have support for GitHub projects. Um, there are many other tools than Code Climate, but I found that to be the most, um, most broad. I've created a repository and I'll show this slide at the end as well, if you want a link. Um, GitHub.com slash Joseph D. Purcell slash Code Climate in Drupal. It'll show some examples of how to configure Code Climate. I'll show a quick example, just so you ha have some context as we go through uh, what I'm about to talk, talk about next. So the Code Climate YAML, uh, you specify what engines you want. PHP mess detector. I'm able to configure uh, Drupal coder to apply here. Now, when I originally wrote this code climate YAML, um, the, uh, 
they, they, they didn't have the Drupal code sniffs installed. Um, but it, I was able to contribute that back because it's open source. They have um, the, uh, their, their static analysis engine. You could, if you wanted to write your own static analysis tool, you could uh, contribute that back. So anyway, I've got PHP mess detector. I'm looking for a PHP files, ink files, module install. And then I'm also doing PHP code sniffer. And that's, that's where Drupal um, code style applies. And then there's a rating section. So one of the things we're gonna talk about is a GPA. GPA is an indication of your overall health of the project based on the number of issues combined with the like weight of the code, lines of code. Um, so the rating section there, I'm just looking for my custom modules and then I have some exclu exclude pass. Cause I, I don't wanna rate core cause that doesn't apply to my project. Um, and I also don't want to rate contrib. I just want to look at my code. So that's a quick example. Uh, the PHP mess detector XML file is a configuration file just for the PHP mess detector tool. I also have this example up on GitHub if you want to use it. Um, the point here is that Ed, there's configuration involved to show you what I'm going to show you next. Two main ways you can tie in static analysis. And that this is like, this is, this is the moment. This is the, these are the key takeaways for today. There are two ways you can, you can tie in static analysis. One is in your development workflow. I mentioned continuous inspection. So we're gonna talk about that next. The other is doing a code audit. Code audit might apply um, at the end of a sprint, et cetera. So we'll get to that next. So development workflow. Uh, there's a book called Continuous Integration, and I, I love the story that's told here. The idea is, imagine you could hit one button on your keyboard, have all everyone's code uh, is merged, integrated, your tests are run. Uh, if you had code that you needed to compile, if it wasn't PHP, or I guess you could, well, yeah, let's say it's like Java or something, compile it. You do your database integrations, run inspections, and then automatically deploys. So imagine you had one button to do that. If you're doing um, uh, continuous integration, you, and you're not doing this step, you're missing out on a critical part. Static analysis or inspection of your code should, should be done in, in parallel with your automated tests. So if you're doing continuous integration, also consider doing uh, static analysis checks, because if you're not, you are wasting time. So I've identified some features that I think any tool that's gonna help you in your day-to-day your -day workflow. Um, one key feature is isolation of violations by commit or PR. So I've seen some activity on Drupal.org for getting PHP mess detect, or uh, sorry, Drupal coder involved in the issue queue. But one of the challenges there is how do you, how do you make sure that if there's a violation that's only applying to my, my code? So if you're looking to incorporate this on your own project, you may not want to start out day one by just running PHP mess detector or running PHP code sniffer because it's going to come up with tons of errors and you may not have time to fix all of them. So a good tool, in my opinion, is able to isolate only the changes that you have uh, when you're doing code review. Ability to address false positives, those will happen. Some tools will let you dismiss those violations as, okay, we're aware of this violation, it's intentional. Um, maybe it's a static call to a logger and there's a reason for it. Indicator of overall health. If your static analysis tool isn't able to aggregate the number of issues or the impact of those issues in a way that the whole um, project team is aware, um, then I, I think there's a loss of value. You also want to have weighted impact. Not every violation is the same. Like a code style violation is gonna be different than someone throwing in like uh, a whole bunch of access to like global variables. Right, like these two things are valued differently. Open source integration with tools like PHP CS. This is important because 
by having an open source tool, you can do uh, more collaboration that way. And the ability to run the static analysis locally if you're using PHP Storm or what have you. For these reasons, I think Code Climate is a good fit um, if it's almost all of these. So your day-to-day -day workflow is gonna look like you run static analysis in your editor. I hope you all have static analysis configured in your editor. Um, if you're using PHP Storm, you can configure it to lint your code, whether that's CSS, HTML, PHP. There's linting for all of that or code style checks for all of that. So you, you run that in your editor, you make your commit, you push that up, you have your automated test run, in parallel, it's running static analysis. If it fails, which means that I've contributed a violation, I, I see that, I get a notification, I revise it. If it succeeds, then code is reviewed and merged. <coughs> what this looks like, if you're on GitHub, um, Aiden Feldman uh, at ATNF, uh, they're using Code Climate, and this is what it looks like. So if he gets a pull request and he sees green, and he sees green on code climate, he doesn't have to look through for code style. It's done, it's already done for him. Computer did it. So we can just merge this. Now if there is a failure, it'll show up red. He can click on details, and details will take him to a page that shows, you know, here's the specific violation. Uh, their interface has changed a little bit, but you have some actions here. One action is you can say, yeah, th this was understood. Like there, I, I can clearly see there was a reason for this. So you click, yeah, this is an accepted violation. And then it shows green and you can merge it. You also get to see per pull request, if there is a violation, you get to see overall impact on quality of your project. So maybe it's late in the game, you see some violations and you're like, I really don't want to send this code back for revision, it needs to get merged because we got to get this out the door. You can see the impact on, on the GPA. Just kind of a gut, gut check feeling for, you know, how, how bad is it? What is the overall impact? Now, there, this is the second way that it ties into your day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week, is a code audit. You do this during planned refactoring. Um, there's kind of a misconception in the Agile community that you can iterate from a bicycle to a race car. It's not really true. You need to have planned refactoring along the way. You will accumulate technical debt. So maybe you plan uh, a certain period of the project. Let's say it's a year project. Maybe month six, uh, you, you plan two or three days to just focus on clean up. Clean up. Or maybe you use it in a sprint retrospective. End of the project you see all right, you know, team, I know this is a difficult sprint. We push some stuff out the door. How bad did we do? What, what cleanup do we need to do out there? With a tool like Code Climate, you could get a list of, you know, here's the GPA rating by file. So I know that um, and the image is very whitewashed here, but I know that I've got, you know, a handful of uh, files that are rated F, which means there's a lot of violations relative to lines of code. So maybe at the end of the sprint, we say, all right, let's spend two, three hours and go clean up some code stuff. Great value to the project. And hopefully at the end of the sprint, you don't have a lot of tickets open. So you can do these kinds of uh, changes without creating merge conflicts. Another way, and this one I love, um, there's a tool called PHP Metrics. It is a tool that generates uh, static analysis uh, reports for you uh, with a web interface, it's got lots of graphs, they have good documentation. I've taken one of those graphs here and I have efferent coupling along the horizontal axis, which means as you move along that axis, the class knows about <coughs> more classes. So it's gonna be harder to test, harder to extend. The vertical axis, is cyclomatic complexity. So further up along that, you go, you know, that might be indication of uh, uh, single responsibility principle. It's gonna be hard to test, et cetera. 
So what's interesting is, you know, looking at this and seeing what kind of bubbles up to the, to the edge. And you have Drupal kernel, the Drupal class, right? Because it knows about all these things. It's got the logger, container, etc. Uh, form builder, very complex. Uh, a lot of stuff going on there. Entity API. I don't know if you've ever looked at archive tar, but it's just like one big file, immense complexity. It's not broken out into different classes. What's nice about this chart, you can immediately take, I don't have to be a technical person. I can look at this and I can ask my team. And I can say, hey, Entity API, how come all these classes are out here? Is that something that we might be able to improve on? Refactor, make, make it easier to maintain. Uh, archive tar, it's really complex. Could we spend some time breaking that out into other classes? Reduce the complexity, make it easier to debug. So what not to do? Um, I've seen some bad things. Um, ways in which static analysis can work against you. And we'll go through some of those examples. Static analysis is only as good as it's configured to be. Um, I, so for example, code climate, and I, th I think this is very mm, poor choice, I, but I don't have a better suggestion, is out of the box, you throw code at code climate, it's gonna run and it's gonna give you a GPA. But it's not configured. So it, it's just like a best guess at what checks and violations make sense. Um, but for example, you could end up in a situation where you're running a PHP mess detector on JavaScript code. It doesn't make sense. Um, so it's only as good as it's configured to be. A corollary to this, if you ever see a GPA or you see someone talk about um, quality metrics for a project, don't take it at face value unless you know it was configured correctly. Unless you know someone took the time all right, here's the directories that are actually our code versus uh, contributed directories, et cetera. It's not a replacement for your brain. Um, there are some checks that I think could be improved. I think there are some checks that apply better in certain situations than others. If you're going through uh, the, pr the process with your team to incorporate static analysis, make sure everybody's on the same page. Take time to educate your team. Um, if, if you're on a Drupal project, I've done some, some of the legwork for you to create a, a curated PHP mess detector and um, uh, incorporating the Drupal coder st um, style checks. Uh, so I've, I've done that, so you, you, could, you could take that and run with it. But if you're not in Drupal uh, or you're writing custom code, just make sure that your team is aware uh, before you take this on. And don't compare GPAs of projects that use different configurations. Doesn't make sense. Like, different projects are gonna value things differently. Um, saying you comply with PSR2, that's, that's, that's uh, easier to do than saying you comply with Drupal code standard. Like Drupal code standard is way more specific than PSR2. Um, so it, it's kind of unfair to say, you know, if you see two GPAs, um, or correction, it can be unfair to, to make that comparison. So just be aware that GPAs might, ha might be computed in different ways. So it may not be a one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, but don't avoid static analysis because there's too much to tackle. Um, it's similar to trying to get 100% um, test coverage. If you have a unit test suite and you're trying to get 100% test coverage, it's kind of the same principle. You can shoot for 100% compliance with your static analysis tool is just really hard. Um, that goal is good sometimes, but in other times, especially with a project team, it, it may not make sense. It may not be valuable to your client to get 100% coverage, but spend 20% of the effort and you'll get 80% of the be benefit here. And don't run static analysis locally. They should be shared just like tests. If, if your automated tests are failing, your team should be aware. Um, you know, you're doing code review, you merge a PR, tests on develop run, and it fails, team should be aware. Because um, that, that does impact the team, right? 
And in a similar way, static analysis, it impacts the, the other people on the team. And I like this graph. It, it shows over time the cost of owning a mess. Uh, Doc Martin, Robert Martin, uh, he has a book called Clean Code. And over time, you have um, high productivity in the beginning because you're not dealing with a whole bunch of code style violations. But over time, uh, you know, we went through some examples earlier that builds and if you're not planning time to do some refactoring or clean as you go, um, you lose productivity. So you're going to save time by focusing on this. You're not wasting time looking for code style. We looked at that pull request that was green. If I'm reviewing that, I don't have to look for code style. That's already done. I can just focus on functionality just to meet the business requirements. You're not worrying about obvious bugs or typos. I have um, broken production before because I uh, mistyped a variable name. That would get caught with static analysis. If you set this up properly with your team, you can clean as you go, and you know the parts that are hard to change. So you don't have to keep grinding on, on code. You can have time to say, hey team, this is what looks like, like is hard. Is that reflective? Can we spend some time to refactor? So what's coming next? Um, I, as the Drupal community, I think if we could agree on a static analysis tool and a configuration for Drupal 7, um, Drupal 8 core and contrib, as well as projects, um, we, we have one, we, like we have Drupal Coder, but it's missing some of the checks from PHP mess detector and PHP copy and paste detector. <laughs> Agree on a process for versioning these, right? So um, you say, hey, I've got 100% compliance, and then you introduce a new violation and you roll that out. Um, people should be, be aware of that. How, how does that happen? What does that process look like? Start using analysis on corn contrib. There's a ticket out here. Um, I think, I'm optimistic. I think that Code Climate could solve this now. Um, I've had some conversations with uh, people on the infrastructure team, and I, I know there's challenges to this, but um, at least for your own projects, if you're on GitHub, uh, you can use Code Climate today if you want. Ensure the community has the same checks on their projects. Um, Drupal Coder is great because we can all share that. Um, but that infrastructure isn't there, right? Like we, we have this problem with tests, trying to run Drupal's tests locally, it's kind of, it's, it's a challenge. Um, we have the same challenge with static analysis. Could we have more public infrastructure that we could use for our own projects? Uh, maybe. Uh, with Code Climate, you can create an engine. We could have a Drupal engine, and if you're paying for a private project, you could just say, hey, here's the engine that I want to run, and the Drupal community can keep that up to date. And sure, editors can integrate with the same checks. We don't want the case where, you know, Drupal.org is running checks that you're not doing on your local machine. And add GPAs to compare to contrib modules right now, um, it's kind of based on, well, I've used this module before, so I trust it, or I've heard this other person has used it, great, I'm gonna use that. Or you look at popularity, how many downloads. Um, GPA could be a way during the module acceptance process, someone submitting a new module, GPA could be a way to be a quick gut check of how well have they done on code style. Um, it could also be a good check for are they writing documentation, right? Um, these things might be helpful uh, for the community. Now there's some longer term interesting things I wanna include. Um, imagine the security team could have a, uh, a check written for any security issue that they find. If they find a pattern, imagine them being able to push out an update to uh, Code Climate Engine Everybody just hits rebuild on their project and they can see if that violation is there. That would be amazing. Uh, Ruby's Breakman already has a uh, tool that does something similar to this. Imagine if automated code quality spike tickets could be published. So a module you know, merges code and it drops below a certain GPA and a ticket is created saying, hey, 
Um, can you spend some time to clean up your code? Uh, use analysis reporting as a way to deprecate Drupal API calls, especially as we go into Drupal 9, um, and we, we, we want to not have to like reinvent the wheel. Could you write static analysis checks to deprecate certain API calls? Yeah, you could. You could do that. And then publish that update and say, hey, everybody, <coughs> we're deprecating, deprecating this entity API call. Run this check, and immediately you're aware, oh, I need to go fix these three things. It can also indicate improper unit usage. The Linux kernel team, uh, they do something similar to this. And lastly, you could use these checks in an autocorrect. Imagine you submit your patch. And you could use PHP code beautifier and fixer to automatically fix these problems for you. That's pretty cool. Now we talked about Mariner 1. Mariner 2 launched 36 days after the Mariner 1 failure. This was the first interplanetary, first successful inter interplanetary mission. We learned some very interesting things about Venus, such as the <laughs> atmosphere can melt lead. I think with this kind of discipline um, in our community, I think we can do great things. I, I think we can um, do what we do a lot better. So thank you. Uh, come to the sprints on Friday, and you can see the slides up here. And find me after this talk if you want to chat more. Thank you.